have your Bibles, turn, to, turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, verses 53, 58, just a few verses today. Did, did it feel like we had a separate sermon series with chapter 13? Well, this is, okay, thank you, wife. Oh, she humbles me. All right, Matthew chapter 13, verses 53, 58. I'm going to read y'all follow along. If you have it, say, oh, yeah. All right. And when Jesus had finished his parables, he went away from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And, and are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And all God's people said. Follow me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today and for your word. Uh, we treasure it. We believe that it is beautiful. It is rich. And I pray that today, today would be a profitable time for us. So open our hearts, open our eyes, so we receive you well. We thank you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Jesus grew up in a rural, small town called Nazareth. And he was later baptized by his prophet cousin named John. And in, in, in his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended down upon Jesus, appointing and anointing Jesus for the beginning of his earthly ministry, where he was then led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by Satan, and to be tested for 40 days, and yet still was without sin. Then Jesus began his ministry. And so he would preach, and he would teach, and, he would, and people would just flock over to him. And he was popular. He was a bit of a rock star. He was awesome. He was winsome. And he had this type of authority, the way that he spoke, that they've never seen anywhere before. And so he began to preach and teach at these synagogues and doing what he does best, teaching the word of the Lord. Now, synagogues are pretty much like churches where people would come together like a congregation like this, and they would gather together to hear the scriptures, and they would gather together to hear the preaching, and they would worship together, and they would do some prayers together, and they would do some praise together. And these synagogues were typically small because these synagogues were in typically small rural towns, and these weren't large areas. These people who consist the the, that these people in these small towns were, were small uh, town folks, farmers, illiterate, right? Kind of blue-collar people. This isn't a big city, so in this area, there wouldn't be thousands of individuals collecting and coming together. No, in these synagogues, it would be maybe dozens, maybe at most a couple hundred people. And yet Jesus would go to these synagogues, and he would preach. And as he would preach, man, it would get packed. Other towns, other areas, people would get word, and they would come and come, and they would hear and listen to th this amazing teacher, this rabbi. They want to see and hear Jesus. And so throughout his ministry, the fame of Jesus spread. And so he goes, and he heads towards Nazareth, his hometown. And this is where he kind of grew up. Nazareth was a small area, and then people, they lived in these small homes, maybe about Four to 600 square feet. Back in my bachelor days, I lived in a 440 square foot uh, studio. Paid around $1,200, $1,300 a month. And it was horrible. I was in my bathroom and in the living room at the same time. But back then, that's how big their homes were. And, and typically, they would also share the same living space with their livestock. It was small. And so it wasn't a big place, and this place was not a big deal. But Jesus comes teaching at their synagogues. And so the people, they will come to hear him, and they were simply astonished. They were astonished at his wisdom. They were astonished at his teaching and his authority. And he was just so compelling, and they were drawn to that. But then, all of a sudden, they go, hold on, hang on, because it suddenly dawns on them. They go, isn't this the, the son of Joseph? Isn't this Jesus the guy we all kind of grew up with? Didn't he play with our kids? Wasn't he in our little league team? These are the people who grew up with him. They knew about him. They were families and relatives and friends and neighbors, and they're all just kind of having a, a bit of a hard time accepting him as Lord and Savior. 
So these folks who would have known Jesus, they took offense at him, it says in verse 57. So Jesus, he kind of responds back by saying, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and his own household. A prophet has no honor in his hometown. And you think about that. Do you think about the people taking offense at this Jesus who had come doing all these things and making all these claims, and then they take offense, and maybe you're like, those people are stupid. Those people are silly. Look at what Jesus is doing, and yet they still deny him. But here's the thing. I think the response is reasonable. I get it. I remember many times in marriage counseling sessions, like I'll say something to, let's say, the wife. Okay, The husband and wife are sitting in front of me, and I'll say something to the wife, and and she'll nod, and she'll say, wow, I never saw it that way. Or, oh, oh, or wow, that's, that's a really good thought. Thank you so much, Pastor David. And then the husband will blurt out, what the heck, wife? I told you that so many times before. And all because Pastor David says it, it's like golden. <laughs> There's a saying, an expert is the guy from out of town. Like, I've spoken at many retreats in my life, and I'll preach a sermon that their hosting church pastor has many times preached on. And after the service, the attendees will come up to me and say, man, I never knew that's what that passage meant, or wow, that was really insightful. And then what I would do is afterward, I would go offline with the hosting pastor, because he's usually a buddy of mine or a friend, and we talk about it, and then he would shake his head, and he's like, bro, this is so irritating that when I preach that same message with the same points, people are like, what? But when you come and say, they're like, wow, this is inspired. And it's worked the same for me, too. Whenever I have guest speakers come to my church, and in fact, I have a good friend coming this, uh, this winter to speak at our uh, youth winter retreat. And I bet if he were to preach on Matthew, the youth kids will say, wow, this is amazing. How come our church never preaches on Matthew? <laughs> the point is this. The people's words and their response and even their offense, I get it. It was reasonable. Like the old saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. Sometimes the closest to you have the hardest time listening to you. And this will happen all the time. When you get closer to someone, whoever that might be, you'll see them for kind of who they are, right? You get unimpressed. And that's why I don't want to get too close to you all. <laughs> because if you hung out with me too much, you'd be like, wait, and you're our pastor? But here's the thing, when we do get close to people, people we love, like, respect, we also need to learn and know that we're all a work in progress. All a work in progress, and that will become even more obvious and more evident the closer we get to them. Now, whether it's me or any of our staff or our home group leaders or maybe someone you know and trust, a friend of here or a deacon, whomever it might be, the closer you get, you will have this proclivity for you to maybe even respect them a little less. Now, here's the thing. Unless it's some sort of glaring sin issue, just know this, that those leaders, those people, and everyone else for that matter, we're all a work in progress. We're all a work in progress. You know why? Because we're not Jesus. We're not Jesus. We all just work for him. He's the perfect one. And so what our job is and what your job is to one another is to simply show your brokenness, but then point back to the one who restores us. Right? That's all we do, which means that we need to be humble and repentant, and we need to be honest about our fears, failures, and flaws. You see, these folks, they rejected Jesus, and they thought because they knew him, because they knew him that he was unworthy of their devotion. Jesus, we're offended by you and your claims. I mean, who do you think you are? You came from here, and now you're saying that you're that, and Jesus is like, um, I'm the maker of the heavens and the earth. They rejected him. The rejection of Jesus was due to his lowliness. He's like, you're one of us. You grew up with us. You're poor like us. You are nothing like us. And now you claim to be the Lord? Like, who do you think you are? So I have a couple points for us today, okay? 
Here's my first one. Don't get caught up in the lowliness of Jesus. You know those stories of racks to riches. We all love hearing them. In fact, I would say this. I'm assuming many of you guys here were born here in the States. If not, maybe come, came here when you are really young. And so I bet if I were to say how many of your parents had immigrated or come to the States, to America, with just a couple dollars in their pocket and a suitcase, you'd all, probably, all of these hands would shoot up, right? And now they're doing relatively well, at least better than they were wherever they came from, right? Hands would shoot up. So that's the idea, rags to riches. You're low, now you're high. But in the case of Jesus, it was the opposite. You see, the story of Jesus was that he's the son of God. We know that. And he came down into our fallen world for rather worshiping him for such this amazing display of humility and act of grace. Instead, people hated him for it. And it wasn't his teaching they hated, no. Remember, people actually loved what he was teaching. It says in verse 54, where did this man get this wisdom? I mean, they're ooing and aahing over these inspired words of Christ. No, they weren't offended by his teaching. And they weren't offended by his miraculous works either. I mean, the very first miracle that Jesus performed was at the wedding in Cana, which is only 10 miles across, or rather 10 miles up the road from Nazareth. And so presumably, because it's a small town area and people kind of knew everyone here, presumably there were people from his hometown, Nazareth, who probably attended that wedding. And they saw Jesus, and they saw the wine being changed to, or water changed to wine. They saw how good it was. They saw just the festivities and all that stuff. And they saw all that. And they enjoyed all that. And they also know nearly that all the miracles of Jesus that he performed was all done in that area of Galilee. And so his work and his might and his, and his uh, miracles and all these healings were all done and widely known. They knew that. And they were impressed because, again, in verse 54, it says, Man, where did this man get his wisdom and these mighty works and these miraculous powers? So you see, their rejection or their offense, it wasn't at his teachings, and it wasn't at his mighty works, it wasn't at his wonders, it was familiarity they had with issues, that they had issues with. They were like, wait, hold on, this is, is this a carpenter's son? Isn't his mom Mary? Then they go on to name his four brothers and mentions his sisters. And so that meant they knew Jesus Pretty well. I mean, even to the point where Nathaniel, when he met Jesus, he goes, Can anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, that's, that's such a demeaning statement, but apparently the people of the town, they thought the same thing too. This can't be the Messiah. He can't be the king. He can't be the Lord and Savior. No, he's just a small hometown boy named Jesus who was lowly and common. Nothing special, just like one of us. I remember officiating at my childhood friend's wedding a couple years ago. It was pretty much a high school reunion, and, which I typically avoid. And there was a lot of dancing. They're, 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 they weren't Christians, and not to say that you, anyways, whatever. <laughs> now, while people were dancing and going all footloose, I was the wallflower, okay? I was just chilling all the way in the back. And uh, because I don't dance, because I can't dance, because please don't ever make me dance. But I got some really good conversations in. I spoke with some classmates who maybe didn't do so well in high school. I mean, they knew that I knew. We all knew it was a small high school over in D.C. And so before anything else, before, I mean, I don't care, right? I'm not there to judge them. Yeah, but there, there was an insecurity and all that stuff. And and so before I could even say anything in response, they began pretty much reading off to me their resume. Yeah. They're like, yeah, 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 David, you remember? You know the school I got into after high school? I was like, I was like yeah, it's not a big deal. And they're like, well, you know where I got my MBA? From this graduate school. And they're like, hey, you know how like, I was kind of like this or whatever? Well, you know, I have a startup company. We're getting investors now, and now we're starting to make some money. Hey, David, remember that old junk car that I used to drive? 
all throughout high school. I'm like, yeah, dude, everyone drove a junk car back in high school. We all did that. He's like, well, here it is. And he whips out his phone, shows me his like, new ride. He's like, nice upgrade, huh? By the way, these are actual conversations I've had. And I don't know why they were confessing these things to me. They thought I was maybe the priest. I was like, I don't care, right? But they were saying that. But here's the thing. That's how people are. They'll say, yeah, 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 get this. I was low, but look at me now, right? I was low, but look where I'm now. Look at how much better my life is now. Look how much, look how big my house is. Look at the car I drive now. Look at how much money I make. Look at how big my family is. I got all those gallo kids. Look at the clothes I wear and, and check out where I vacation now. Look at all these things. I, I was here. Dave, remember I was here, but now I'm here. Look at me. But the thing about Jesus is that he's the opposite. He started from low, and then he went lower. I mean, let's think about this for a second here. He was already born in a lowly life in Nazareth. He started here already, low. Then he was tempted, and then he was opposed and persecuted. Went lower. Then he was in agony in Gethsemane. And then he was condemned before Caiaphas and Pilate. Lower. Then he was crucified, dead, and buried. Lower. You see, there was no higher point. He just went lower and farther down from his presence, from his place with his father, to the point where he, for the first time in all eternity, was separate from his father as he took upon himself the suffering death of our sins. It wasn't just here. It wasn't just here. He went lower and lower and lower. That's why Apostle Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Do you, do you understand? What Jesus was demonstrating was the gospel. The gospel story is radical. The gospel, gospel story is the opposite story and the opposite narrative of what the world is trying to say. It is completely strange. That's why for us, we love it when a CEO or a powerful leader shows up where we work and pretends to be interested in what we're doing. But we don't want a God who gets his hands dirty and actually knows us as we are. Because what happens is we're more comfortable with a God who's distant and where we can live our undisturbed lives in whatever reality that we live in, but that's just not how God does it. And so what Jesus does is he humbled himself to walk in our shoes and all so that he can show us to the Father. And Jesus, he comes to provide salvation by the way of this most disgusting mess of a tortured God-man on the cross because of our ugliness, of our sins, and rebellion. And what we need to understand is that this messy salvation, it condemns us before it saves us. Meaning this, we need to see that before we receive salvation and see the beauty of salvation, that we need to know what we're being saved from. And Jesus, he shows us that. Lower and lower and lower. He shows us the filth of our sin, the consequences of our sin, the magnitude of our sins, and what he had to do in order to redeem his people. I want you all to know, it is okay to be vulnerable and to expose the brokenness of your lives because Jesus has already shown us that's what he did. He didn't pull himself up. He didn't seek after worldly successes to show off. He went lower, and he became more humble, and then he served us more, and he sacrificed it all for the sake of the glory of his Father and for the sake of your gain. Don't let the lowliness of Christ make you think little of Jesus. Let the lowliness of Jesus cause you to think little of yourself, but greatly of him. Amen? Here's my final point. Are you skeptical? Now let me first clear up what's not. Being a skeptic doesn't mean that you're a seeker or a doubter or someone who wants to see evidence of Jesus' claim. A skeptic is someone who is more than a doubter. He's someone who refuses to believe no matter what the evidence is. 
in verse 58 reads, And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, at first glance, it doesn't sound that condemning, right? I mean, these people were not believing. They were rejecting. They were renouncing, whatever it was. And it's not like they, it's not like they were struck by lightning for their unbelief. All Jesus did was quit doing miracles. He's like, all right, I'm going to stop. All he did was quit doing miracles among them. He just left them alone. Now, when we reject Jesus, and if it appears that he's going away, maybe for some people you find comfort in that. You're like, yes, I'm glad I pulled it off. No more divine nagging. No more people telling me about Jesus. My mom, she's finally clammed up. No more people saying, no more pastoral visits to my house telling me to come to church or anything like that. Yay. Now hear me well. There is a difference between the stillness of God and the silence of God. Stillness of God means God is working and you're waiting. Silence of God is terrifying. The silence of God is terrifying. His silence is not just an easing off. His silence to the skeptic is not you rejecting God. His silence means that God is rejecting you. Roman 1 says it clearly, time after time, that they would not honor him as God, and so what God did is he gave them over to their sinful desires. They rejected God, and so God gave them over to their shameful lusts. They rejected God, so God gave them over to their depraved minds. You see, those who said to God, leave me alone, leave me alone, they will get what they asked for and more. God will leave them alone to let the normal destructive power of their sinful heart work itself out into their lives. And the thing is, man, people have no clue as to how depraved and sinful and wicked we can get without the already existing common grace and mercy of God in our lives. God is working it through us, and we have no idea how God's love keeps us from being even our own worst enemy. Don't you know that your life and whatever semblance of goodness that exists in your life and in your marriage, in your relationship, in your work, any type of health, any type of whatever you might call it, it is held on by the grace of God, by God's grace. But if we reject him, if we don't listen to him, then he will remove himself from us. So as we hear about these skeptics, these folks who just simply will not believe no matter what, it made me think about the different reasons that we might not believe or at least struggle with belief. So I have a few. My first one is this. Is it theological for us? Remember, people loved his teaching. I mean, they loved it when he fed them and performed miracles, but when he said that he was God, and when he was speaking on behalf of God, they were like, nope, mm -mm. nope, you're just Joseph's son. Nope, you're Mary's son. You're a good guy. We grew up with you. Like, I know you, right? But you're definitely not God. Now, some of us, we do that. We like what he teaches, the whole t talking about love and forgiveness and compassion and being kind to your neighbors and so on and so forth. But, man, we don't accept him as God, King, and Savior. You see, maybe there's a theological question that's going on in our minds and hearts today, and it's keeping you from him. Maybe for others, it's an issue of control. Now remember, people loved what Jesus did. In fact, people swarmed to him to see more of him and to perhaps even get a free meal from him. They wanted to be entertained, right? They wanted to be the consumer. But then Jesus is like, nope, I'm not going to play your game. Not going to be your little monkey boy. Not going to be a little puppet. No more. None of that. So as the verse says, he did not do many mighty works there. You see, they wanted to dictate what Jesus did for them. They wanted to only receive these benefits from him. Give me your blessings. I don't care about the blesser. Give me your givings, but I don't care about the giver. I want what helps me. I'm a consumer. And Jesus, he denied them of that. For others, it's a matter of comfort. You know, when Elijah went to the widow and asked her to give up her home, essentially, and what little she had left, do you think that was comfortable for her? 
as she was with her dying son? No. When Naaman, a Syrian army commander, had to go to another nation and go to another god and then go to a river and publicly humiliate himself to, to get fully naked so that he could be cured from his leprosy, do you think that was comfortable for him to walk in that type of faith? No, it wasn't. The reality is this, folks. Some of us, if not many of us, if not all of us here, like comfort. We say this, I would give, but I'm not financially comfortable. I would serve, but the season isn't comfortable. I would pray, but I'm not comfortable. I would do this, or I would do that, but it's just not comfortable. Folks, if that's us, do you know what that means? We worship convenience instead of Christ. For others, it might be embarrassment. You know, I remember back in high school, I had a science teacher who was teaching evolution. And I raised my hand and I had a genuine question to ask. And I said, are there any fossils that show us this evolutionary transition from one type of species to another? I'm curious. Is there any evidence for that? I would like to see it. Like, for instance, if Modern-day archaeologists say dinosaurs have turned into birds or evolved into birds. And I said, then when did that happen? You know? Or if apes became man or whatever it was, when did that happen? So I asked my question. And then she looked at me. She smirked. And she said, David, I'm guessing you're a Christian. By the way, you ain't going to get this in Texas. This is over in D.C., and she said this. Everyone's just holding their breath. And she goes, I'm guessing that you believe everything in the Bible, right? And then she started laughing. My biology teacher in high school, mentoring, teaching 30-plus kids in that class, was laughing at me. And then, all of a sudden, it was followed by a chorus of the entire class laughing at me. Then one girl after class comes up to me and says, by the way, this is a girl I grew up with since kindergarten, first grade. She said, David, we grew up together, but I had no idea how dumb you were. And then she walks off saying, God, Christians are so stupid. Now, by the way, I still didn't get an answer to that question, and the answer is because there is no answer. God created man and woman. In the beginning. We are from Adam and Eve. You are not some chance product. The answer these so-called intellectuals could not give the word of God gives us. By the way, the Bible is not anti-science. Get out of there. Right? God made science, as my brother Sean so eloquently put it afterwards. So I get the whole embarrassment issue. Some folks, they don't want to deal with that. I might get ostracized. I might get kicked out. My friends might laugh at me. My community might mock me. And some folks don't want to deal with that. But let me say to you all this. It is an honor to be humiliated for Christ. Now, while there's so many other reasons why folks are skeptics, I'll finish with this one, going back to the passage here. Familiarity. The people of Jesus, his hometown, they knew Jesus, but the thing is they never knew him. We think just because we've grown up with the stories of the Bible, just because we grew up knowing and reciting a couple verses here and there, yeah, 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 we know about him. He's the guy who, you know, fed uh, a bunch of people with a couple loaves of bread and two fish. Yeah, yeah, he's the guy who walked on water. He's the guy who healed a bunch of people. So here's the thing. A lot of people may have told you about Jesus when you were growing up, but you won't get to know him unless you read it for yourself in the Bible. A lot of people probably prayed for you. Your mom did, your dad did, your grandma did, whomever. A lot of people probably prayed that you would know Jesus, but you won't get to know him until you get on your knees and cry out in prayer and desperation. 
A lot of people have probably told you that, yeah, church is where you go to meet Jesus, and they want to connect you there and all this stuff. But I'll tell you what, you can't really get to know Jesus until you become a part of the body of Christ and where you learn to sacrifice and you learn to love and you learn to serve and worship and give and be held accountable and to love the people who are unlovely and to be loved by them as well. That's when you truly begin to know your Lord Jesus. Being familiar in Christ is not the same as truly living in him. Living your faith vicariously through your more mature family members or friends or even spouse is not the same as Christ living through you. They didn't kill Jesus yet, but they eventually did. And the most amazing thing was that instead of shying away from the suffering and the pain, instead of trying to climb back down from the cross, no, he went lower for us. Lower. And he did so by doing the most amazing thing in the world. He goes and takes our sin upon his sinless self. And then he died to forgive us of all our sin. And I think that's amazing grace. You know what Jesus is? Jesus, he is good to the end. Good to the end. He provides for us as he did for the crowds. He heals us as he did for all the countless people with sickness came to him, and he does so even as we murdered him, and yet he receives us. He goes, I will take your shame, and I will give you my glory. I will take your mess, and I will give you my perfection. He receives our sinfulness, and our brokenness, and our confusion, and our rebellion, and yes, he even receives our skepticism with love with love, if only one day we would humble ourselves enough to see how truly messed up we are and how truly beautiful he is. Now, some of you may reject him like they did in Nazareth, and I beg you not to. Just because you may have rejected Jesus yesterday doesn't mean that you can't surrender to him today. There's still hope for you because there's still life in you. He loves you, and he went to the lowest point of life for you and through his sacrifice he gives you the free gift of salvation to anyone who would believe that he's not just some country bumpkin boy from a world town who these who people grew up with no he is not some ordinary guy but he is the god man jesus christ who is our god king and savior and that is what he declares and that is why we worship him let's pray